there was a downpour of rain and uh, I'm walking up the steps and I just poke at a bubble that was on the wall and all of a sudden water came out. Well, there were three different contractors that we needed for that. We needed a roofer, we needed a masonry, and we also needed a plasterer because we were going to need to dry the whole thing out and fix first fix the box gutter, dry out all the plaster, make sure that the tuck pointing was done on the outside. And those three things went through a process of almost 12 months because we wanted to make sure that the plaster was dry enough. Now we don't know a whole lot of plasterers. So I heard from different friends that they had hired a certain guy. I said, oh, can you give me his number? He was excellent. I think he is probably one of those traditionalists who knows exactly how to do the work. And we've been very happy with it. From a masonry perspective, what did we do, John? Well, one of the companies I worked with, uh, I hired one of their masons uh, to come in and he worked on uh, the weekend. He uh, was able to tuck point the wall, but in a historical house, it is not just somebody coming in and doing it themselves. He had the color of the mortar to match what was there because we didn't want the mortar to sh stick out. If you go to your Home Depot, you can buy mortar. Is it gonna be the right mortar? And is it gonna show later on the color? One thing to know about masonry is you always want the mortar to be softer than the brick that it's being put into because you want the mortar to fail before the brick because that is a lot easier to tuck point than it is to replace a brick. So there's a little tidbit on it. Uh, once he got the tuck pointing done, he pressure washed the walls to make sure it was all clean. And then we had him waterproof it. It was a slock stain material that penetrates into the masonry that seals the water from getting in, but it doesn't give a sheen to the masonry. So therefore it's an acceptable project or product for historical buildings because you cannot tell it's there and we're re replicating where we were. So uh, that work, after we had that work done, we allowed it to sit there for another six months before we did that plaster. Yeah. Because we wanted to make sure that we did not have another water feature. And it has worked. It's been, the work has been done for over a year now. And with all the rains, uh, everything's just great. So then we had to address the box gutters. And uh, we had, again, by word of mouth, heard of a gentleman who uh, was very good at repairing box gutters. We brought him in for that specific project and he gave us short-term solutions because box gutters can be very, very expensive. And yes, we will have to redo all of our box gutters at some point in time, but we needed to be cost-effective and ensure that we were going to fix the emergencies first. So he came in and he fixed that. And, um, and then when we started doing another part of the project, he came in and completed that part of the project as well. And so we have an ongoing relationship with him. I will say this, if you find a good contractor for whatever it is that you need, please be sure to keep a good relationship with them because in old houses, you never know when you're going to need someone of their caliber to come in and do that work. And if they already know your house, they're not starting at ground zero. Another point to that is, if you have an emergency, you are a repeat client and they will typically jump on a repeat clients in an emergency case, holding off their other work and figuring out how to get that cut back up. So we've had that. And we've also had contractors that said, hey, I had to, had to leave for a day because I had to go to a repeat client because they had a problem. So building relationships is always important with this, especially if you're gonna be doing these projects off and on for a period of time. Um, you know, the other thing is you wanna ask people what they like and dislike about a contractor. Every, every contractor is gonna have his pros and cons, strengths and weaknesses. 
Well, let's take their work with their strengths and let's see if we can get the weaknesses, if we can handle those, uh, have those handled in a different direction, such as a lot of carpenters may be able to do drywall, but are they really a good drywall contractor or not? You have to determine that because your end view is your drywall or if you're gonna use the plaster. And in our uh, restoration we just finished on the bathroom, we had that case uh, and it ended up that the drywall, or he hung all the drywall, but he brought somebody in to finish it. So we ended up with a great project. So that brings up a good point, John. Uh, there is such a thing as a uh, rough in carpenter and a finish carpenter. And a rough in carpenter is not necessarily going to be the one who gives you the beautiful finished product. That is another good question to try to bet with the contractors that you interview for your project. Another project, well, with this bathroom project, we need you know, a plumber and electrician to come in and we had to hire them ourselves. But knowing a good contractor, carpenter contractor, he gave us a couple names. His people came, came in, I talked to them, told them what I want done, what we needed done. And they were able to give us a quote. It was very fair on the uh, pricing for it. And they were superior. Again, we went to a reference that used to work with these people before and we work with them again. That's one of the things you really want to consider when you're finding a good contract. Where they are, how people like them. Um, so our project, when we, we also redid our front porch, it had a 110 year old roof on it. Uh, you cannot do a tin roof anymore uh, because you can't put leads in the tin so you would be different metal. So we had a choice. We could use a steel roof that was pre-finished, painted, uh, Kynear paint, which is a 20-year paint. It starts to fade after that. It's quality met, uh, material, and they build buildings with it all the time. Or we could go use a copper roof, which is no, uh, no other work that we have to do on it, and it'll last 100 years. Copper is more expensive than metal. We opted in our case to go with the copper roof for two reasons. First, when we looked at that first house originally, we said, oh, we're probably gonna have to do a roof on that. God, it would be really cool to put a copper roof on this. And then people would see it coming up and down the street. So that was one. The other one is, you know, we just, we're in this house for a lot, the rest of our lives it is the plan at this stage. And, we don't want to have to mess with things when we uh, down the road. Yes, there's things such as painting, the trim and everything. But we said, we're going to put the copper on. It wasn't that much of a premium. Uh, that we could justify it and go on. But then when you get into these jobs, it wasn't just a roofer. All of a sudden, we had to have the carpenter uh, come in because we had a hole in the box gutter. And somebody had to fill that back in. Somebody had to make sure. Everything was good. Somewhere, somebody had drywalled over the beadboard ceiling. We had to find out why. Was the beadboard terrible? Or what was the reason? Uh, all our wood railings were falling apart. Our columns uh, had some splits in it. And what do we do? We thought it was going to be pretty simple. Then we start working on the parts. We realized, oh, our decking was there. Having contractors that can do a lot of different things, especially on the finishes, is so important because he could handle all that and we could walk it. We could walk each one other through it. Because of my experience, I knew what was going on. His experience, he could figure out what it was going to take and knew where the source of the materials easily. And I will say this most people don't have my husband's expertise in the construction field. But if you develop a good rapport with that contractor and you know that you can trust them, you can have these conversations yourself, even if you're a novice. Yes, these contractors, good contractors are after to see that you get a good quality project. And 
it's that I do in my industry. If I can, if I can take and keep everybody safe and I can have a satisfied client, I know I'm gonna make money. These contractors know if they can have a satisfied client, uh, do high quality, they're gonna make money. Uh, and so that's what you're looking for is a top-notch contractor. On May there. I interject a question? Yes, Julie. Um, you know, you would typically find these high-quality contractors. So can you give us a, a advice of, you know, how do I tell if it's a guy with a hammer and a truck to a true craftsman? Yes. Well, again, it, we're how did you find that person in a truck? Was it a reference for somebody? Know what kind of project they did for that reference. Uh, ask for the references. You know, ask for a list of projects they have done similar to yours and do drive-bys. Knock on a door and said, hey, this person did some work there. Can, can you tell us about them? Did you like it? Can we see it? I think that most people, when you go and ask them for some help, will generally be very generous in trying to help you. If you're looking to dig up dirt on somebody, no, they're not gonna do that. But if you're looking for a confirmation that everything's good, I think they're gonna help you. And they'll probably be honest if something didn't work as well. You're talking about the customer. The customer, yes. yes. So uh, if you are asking your contractor for references, they likely will do one of two things. They will either say, well, you, you have to trust me. Or they will say, oh, yeah, here's da 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 da. And you will have several people that you can call and interview and say, how did they do on the job? Were they timely? Did they do what they said they were going to do? Did they come in within the budget or did they go over budget and uh, did they meet your expectations? These are all things that are really critical for you to be able to ask someone who has used that, that um, contractor before. We sometimes um, get very nervous when we see certain trucks around town because uh, while they have a really nice logo, uh, we have heard their rep about their reputations. And um, uh, even though they have a brand new truck and uh, a nice logo, uh, we're smart enough, old enough, and wise enough to know that that doesn't make for a good contractor. Somebody who can give you references that you can go and look at the projects and ask people about their work. That is the contractor that is going to fit your bill. And one of the things you have to uh, ask the contractor is what kind of payment terms they're gonna have. Some guys, they need to be paid on a weekly basis. They're that tight. Well, how are you financing it? If you can only go to your bank once a month with a draw, and then you have to wait a few weeks, is this contractor gonna be the one that's gonna really work for you? Because can you pay them what they need? Or by default, are you gonna put them out of business because they didn't have the funds not to work week to week? That doesn't mean they're bad. That's means that they don't have the same cash flow as some larger companies. Mm -hmm. uh, we were very accustomed. We were happen to be lucky enough that we were paying this out of pocket. So therefore, I've written checks week to week for some of the contractors. Other ones, they build me when they roughed in and then they build me at the finish. Mm -hmm. So there's different styles there. Mm -hmm. So ask them what the payment terms are so you don't have any surprises. If you tell somebody to proceed and all of a sudden, oh, I need to be paid weekly, let's have that conversation up front. Uh, and, and I'll say another thing that uh, a lot of people don't uh, quite understand is the permitting process. Uh, uh, your contractors should have a good working knowledge of what they need permits for, for and what they don't need permits for. And John, if you can talk a little bit about that as far as plumbing, electrical, and anything else that would have, have to be permitted before work can begin and how that process works. Well, just for our simple bathroom project, we needed a building permit, a plumbing permit, and an electrical permit. 
We uh, weren't going to be doing any HVAC, so we did not need an HVAC permit on this one. Uh, we prepared the drawings ourselves, which were all just hand sketches. It wasn't architectural grade. And then I wrote a whole scope of work up so each trade knew what they're going to do. And I include those as part of our uh, building permit. So we applied for our own building permit that way. But the electrical contractor, he submitted for his, did his design, whatever he had to do and submitted for that permit. And the plumbing contractor did the same thing. They knew where we wanted fixtures, but we didn't tell them the size of pipes. They put that all down, they submitted, and they paid for their permits. On the building permit, we paid for that. Plumbing paid for his own uh, plumbing permit and electric contractor had to pay for his electrical. Um, so another thing about what John is talking about, he used the term scope of work. So you just bought a house. You've never owned a house before. What in the heck is a scope of work? Scope of work is just a list of all the things that have to be done within the house. If you have a good general contractor, and we're talking pretty big contracts at this point in time, um, that uh, anything over $20,000, you're probably going to have somebody managing your contract for you. Um, so that person will help you put together that list of things that need to be done so that they know what permitting needs to happen and when it needs to happen. I do want to interject here um, because there's a lot of misconceptions because contractors often say, I'll get the permit, and then they don't. Yeah. So I just want everybody to be very aware ultimately the responsibility for that permit being pulled is the property owner yeah. and um and just we want to always look and ask in whom that permit where it's supposed to be viewable from the public right away yeah. and that's a good point there are some contractors that will say oh I'll get, don't worry i'll get a permit or you don't need a permit technically every project you need a permit on if you're gonna be changing the structure. In historical houses, if you're changing the appearance of the exterior at all, you need to go get a permit uh, for historical review. We have done that numerous times on our house. Uh, and, and there's times when you do that and you can actually help get some funding from the city or the county with that, you need to ask that question if they have any funds for helping maintain a historical house. That's a little tip. So here in Campbell County, um, to uh, learn about the permitting process, uh, where is the first place that you would call as a property owner? I would call your municipality. We called up Bellevue and they told us, yes, we had to go for the uh, historical restoration uh, permit, and then it would go to Campbell County. So we knew knew that. Uh, so I think in Newport, it was a Newport, if I'm not mistaken, I don't think Campbell County handled Newport, I think they have their own. Department. I think, yes, Newport, so Newport has is their, their own, own building department. Mm -hmm. Building so, permitting yeah, department. So that's where you would go there. Covington, I'm pretty sure, has their own uh, building department. No, no, Jody's checking her head. No. At this point, Covington uses PDS preservation. Okay. 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 So you, you can, they call it starting in your municipality. They will direct you because they want to make sure things are done well to keep all the houses up to date and uh, as legal as they can for the area. Um, it's not, I found, even though I work with uh, building permit departments periodically uh, in Campbell County, they were very helpful in there, uh, easy to work with, even with COVID going on. Um, I, I will say for um, historic preservation purposes, um, if you are going for historic tax credits, um, the people in Frankfurt, uh, at the Kentucky Heritage uh, Council are very helpful to work you through the process. Um, and 
while you're working through that process, you are actually starting the process of um, hiring the contractors in a way, because you're looking at your project from soup to nuts and saying, okay, this is what we can do. And this is how we're going to get this attained. So it becomes the basically the first proposal uh, and then the actual proposal is what you work through with your contractor. When you're going back to different things with finding the contractor, you also want to ask them what their workload is right now and how patient you are. So many contractors are busy right now because we've all been doing remodeling projects because we couldn't get outside. Uh, hopefully they start getting caught up, but you need to uh, just ask those questions so you are aware of where you're going, uh, what's going on. And you're not, you don't have one expectation, but the contract is a different and you got to remember them all back together. Um, if a little thing, when you get your budget together, make sure that you have uh, some contingency uh, if they tell you it's going to be $10,000, don't just put $10,000 aside, put some extra. There will be something that's going to come up. Uh, hopefully not, but be aware because in the middle of a project, if all of a sudden something comes up, it's going to cost you another $500. You say, oh, I don't have that $500. What are you going to do? You get to stop the project or you get to shortcome something else. So have, have a contingency just for those things that invariably come up um you know in a lot of small contractors are they working are they the owner and they just manage everything or are they actually working on the crews we have found that the ones that have people working on their crews are the ones you probably want on your prop project because they're into it uh they're their names on the line. I mean, it's, it's found that, that that's more charming for us. They know what's going on. And we have somebody every day that we can talk to, not just an employee that's out there. That's what I was told to do the, yeah, um, on it. Yeah, the, the small contractor uh, who has a crew, if he's on premise and he knows what's going on with your project, uh, he has a good investment in it. If he is sending guys out and you'd never see him again, uh, likely he just does not have a really good handle on what's going on with your project. And if you're hiring him as this or her as the small contractor, um, you want to make sure that they are people that can be trusted. And if they know what's going on with your project, they will be somebody you can trust. Also, you need, you have people working around your house, in your house. You need to know what their needs and expectations are. Are you going to leave a door open so they can go in and use the bathroom? Are they going to have a dumpster? Or are they going to haul it away in a truck every day? There's a lot of questions to ask. Every project has its, uh, different parameters, but you don't want to leave uh, just piles of debris sitting in your yard going to ruin your grass. It's going to make the neighbors upset. Uh, so know that stuff up front and how it's going to be handled. Uh, you know, are they going to sweep up after themselves every day? We've been very lucky that our contractors have worked a lot of residential on existing facilities, places where people are living. And they have cleaned up very well on a daily basis, swept it up. Um, so to know those things up front and what your expectations are, let them know what your expectations are and they will let you know how they deal with those. Another thing which is very important is that contractors are required to have occupational license in the area where they are working. You need to ask, uh, we ask our contractors, do you, do you, uh, do you have the, uh, or the Bellevue uh, um, license? Uh, and they, some of them may have to go get them. It's fairly easy for them to do it. Other ones, oh yeah, I've got that all the time because I'm working here. You don't want to get caught because the city will drive through. 
you've done a building permit. They know that work is going on. So you don't want to, you want to make sure your contractors have that so you can show it. You don't want all of a sudden your work to be stopped because that contractor doesn't have it and he's got to get cleaned up with the city before he can continue again. Um, one thing on the building, going jumping back to the building permits, we display in our front window the two, we actually have two permits right now. One was for the historical that it fit the needs of the historicals who were approved there. And, and, and that's called a certificate of appropriateness. And then we have our building permits sitting there. Now, when somebody drives by, they know we have taken the right steps for the work we're doing. Even though you may not see it, our bathroom happens to be off the back and they workers were being in the back alley. That doesn't matter, but they could see that we have done the work appropriately. When we happen to do our front porch, we had the certificate of appropriateness hanging there. We did not have a building permit because on that project, we asked the city, do we need a building permit? No, this was just some replacement. It wasn't a whole build, at least we didn't think it was gonna be, uh, but we were just put, taking pieces out and putting the same pieces back and painting them. So we did not require a building permit. You can ask that question so the city will tell you if they really think you need one or not. So with all that, are we still having fun doing this, John? Well, we're not about to quit right now. <laughs> uh, we're gonna take a little break after our third project here and breather, but we were talking on the way over here today about building some planters for around a shed in the back yard. Yeah. So, and, and there's always other things that have to go on, but for now, it we're still having fun doing this kind of work. And um, uh, I think part of what sets us at ease is that we know how to look for contractors. We know how to ask the questions. And neither, John, of course, is never afraid to ask the questions. Me, as a woman, I'm not afraid to ask the questions either because if it's something I don't know, I want to be educated about it. And once somebody tells me what they believe is the truth, I can always go and research that to make sure that what I learn from them jives with what I learn in my research. And it's a simple little things uh, that we didn't discuss that come back, such as just last week, where did the towels hangers could go. Well, we've already moved one towel hanger, probably moving another one. Mm -hmm. Those are the little things, sticks. they're gonna come up. You can't talk about everything, but we wanna make sure, you know, you, you talk trying to work it out as much as possible. And then when things need to be changed, that's just part of what, okay, I said, they have a contingency, things come up. You, you can do it and not feel bad about it. Uh, those things can always be fixed. Uh, if somebody builds a bad wall that's got a big crook in it, you are not going to be able to fix that easily because you're going to be doing the exterior the interior. There is also things when it comes down to it, if you need to uh, reduce your budget, there are ways to do it. On the bathroom project, we originally planned on taking all the stud walls down, supporting the roof. We found out that it was going to be over budget so we decided to leave the existing floor framing and we left the existing fr uh, wall framing and worked around it. But we continued to put all brand new insulation in because we did not know the quality of insulation beforehand. So we brought it up to our standards with uh, some compromises to look work within a budget. So there's always ways to do that. Is, are there any questions out there, Jody? Is anybody? Um, there are not, but when I ask you a question, please repeat it because they're not hearing me well. Okay. Um, have you had a problem with contractors not showing up or saying a bid you a bid? You know, all of those sorts of situations we hear about. So the question is do we have a problem with contractors not showing up, not giving a bid? is not answering their phone or returning a call. And the answer is yes and no. We didn't have too much problems this time, again, because we were working on references. 
And when I would call him, I said, this person recommended you to us. So I've already got a leg in. Uh, now, how quickly they return calls, that gets to be a question sometimes. Uh, these guys are working during the day. Uh, you might have put in a couple calls uh, because in the hustle bustle, I know I forget a lot of those return things. So you might have to remind them. Uh, but for the most part, you should expect that they would get back to you. Trades showing up. Uh, yes, we had that one time and I tried to call our carpenters numerous times during the day and I never got a message. It came, he called me the next morning, he said, I'm gonna be there. Uh, I had an emergency I had to do yesterday. He had one of his clients had a flood in, in their uh, place of business. And as a repeat client, he had to go fix it. I totally understand that. And, I, and as I told him, I said, I understand that, but I didn't know because I didn't know why you weren't there, what was happening. And I'm scheduling people behind you. So I need to know these things. Um, our electrician and the plumber, I say, hey, I need you there next Monday. Well, I'm gonna come on Tuesday because that's the day my inspector can get there. And it's only gonna take me half a day to do this work. Okay, now I understand that. So generally, if you have a relationship with your contractors, they're gonna show up. Uh, if they know where you're at, they're, they're gonna get prices to you or they're gonna tell you they can't do it. Um, and, they, and if you get a referral from someone else, Make sure you mention their name when you want to schedule and hire and schedule those contractors because they don't want to upset past clients. And uh, so they will be more than likely um, returning your calls in that respect. But yes, it is a very frustrating thing these days. We hear it a lot. People say that they, they call and they call and they call and they can't get contractors to show up. And, and it is a very frustrating thing. Um, you just mentioned inspectors. So can you talk a little bit about to get the permits for the other kids to have? Okay. Inspections are required uh, for framing. You have to do it before you put any insulation in the walls. So that means you're, you get all your studs, you get your floor framing in. You have to have them look at it before you fill the stud cavities. Now you can put your electric and your plumbing in, that's fine. Before you do insulation, you have to have an electrical inspection for your rough installation uh, and plumbing for the rough installation. And uh, they, then they need to come out and check those before you can put insulation in. You put the insulation in, you get to do uh, insulation inspection before you can hang your drywall. The next time our building inspector comes back is at the end after the final electrical inspection, the final plumbing inspection. If you have HVAC, you gotta add all those things on there. Uh, you are not supposed to use the area until you have that final inspection. You can use it gently, but you don't wanna go on for a month and just keep on using it. Uh, our plumbing just got in uh, last Wednesday. He's got his insp uh, inspection on Monday. I'm calling for my, our building inspection on Tuesday. So it, you know, we, we're doing a bang, bang, but you need to do it. Just because the work done, don't assume that it's okay. Because otherwise they'll come back to you in six months and hey, this permit's still open. What's going on with it? And don't put yourself in that position. Uh, we Q&A, we are receiving some questions about is there a credible site to find um, contractors to Google? Um, is there anyone you can tell us you're happy with to remember they're not doing? Um, so can you yeah. answer those kind of questions? So one of the things that I always tell people to do is, is to get a contractor's name and see if they're listed on the Better Business Bureau. That would be a very first thing to do. As far as um, a site, uh, I have heard different things about Angie's List, um, Emily's List. Uh, there are a number of different sites, but I don't know as much about the credibility of those contractors. 
Um, so I would be hesitant to, to um, refer anyone to those sites. When you are Googling contractors, you really do want to get references on those contractors so that you can make sure that the work they say they do is work they are doing. And again, going back to word of mouth, it is your, going to be your best resource for those people. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, you know, that's how I would go about getting contractors, have typically how we do it. And, you know, so if people are in the neighborhood in, in Bellevue, they know where we are. Uh, a lot of them, they're more than welcome to come and ask us, hey, who do we use for one job or another? Uh, we're happy, with, we've been lucky. We were happy with the people we brought in. So we were happy to share their names. And, and Jody, I don't know if this is appropriate or not, but if people want to find out who we have used for specific projects, we'd be happy to give that information, but I don't know that it's appropriate for us to do that on, on video. Okay. Uh, so let them know they can reach out to Northern Kentucky Restoration. Absolutely, yeah. and we'd be happy to share that. So, let, let, I'm so sorry. reach out to the historical uh, renovation weekend uh, if you want to get North, in touch Northern with Northern Kentucky, Kentucky Restoration, Restoration Weekend. Okay, if you want to get a hold of us. Uh, anything else pop through yet? Yeah, we're just getting that. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, how much time do we have left? We got five minutes. So let's just sort of rehash where we've been. Uh, plan your project. Sometimes you may need an architect, which we didn't say before. Sometimes you can do a hand sketch. Find contractors that you're going to uh, be able to do. Maybe you can find a general contractor that will handle all of your trades. Uh, we did not talk about selecting materials, uh, but you need to know what grade material on our bathroom. We happen to provide all the plumbing fixtures, all the lights, and all the ceramic tile. With the help of a designer. With the help of a designer. So we could do that uh, because if you ask a plumber, give me a price. Well, what kind of toilet do you want? What kind of uh, bathtub do you want? What kind of faucets? They all have different prices. You can go to a Home Depot. And yes, you can get a faucet for $30. Is that really what you want for a long term? So, and it may be, and that's all fine, but you have to set those parameters. It uh, doesn't mean you need to go buy it yourself, but you need to know what kind of allowance they have and where they want, want you to go look uh, to find them. Um, and the recapping of the permitting yeah. process. Yeah, and uh, on the permit, you want to go get your permit. It will take uh, electrical and plumbing to get their permits usually in a week's time. It took uh, for our Campbell County about two weeks, uh, but from the time we submitted it until we actually got the paperwork back. Um, in other places, it can be a lot more than that. Um, so always be aware. And if they're, they may come back and ask you a question on something, that can add a week to it easily. So don't wait till the last minute to try and get your permit. Um, oddly enough, we struggled with getting a dumpster uh, because we wanted a small dumpster because they could get it down the alley. Uh, that, that got to be a little bit of a challenge for us. Uh, well, we could actually find one, but it's cost prohibitive. So we ended up uh, working through some other avenues and we found a good company for the dumpster. They had the small ones. Um, you know, ask, talk to your contractor on a daily basis. Ask them where they're at. Uh, just let them know you're checking in on them. If you have a question, what they're doing, ask the question. If they're not there during the day, you have a question at night, leave them a note and ask them to give you a call. Uh, they'll be responsive to that. And if they started a project, you have every right to call them and say, hey, why are you not here today? Because they may have a schedule where they have to do something in another part of the city, but you don't know that unless you have uh, good communication. 
And then at the end of the project, if something, after they're all done and gone, inspections are all done, and something breaks, don't be afraid to call. A reputable contractor is gonna come back. Now they may say it's not their responsibility, but this is what they'll come back and look at it and tell you what needs to be done. So don't be afraid just that all oh, they're paid, you can't call them anymore. Yes, you can. A good contractor is gonna at least respond to you. And the last thing I'll say is this. Yes, your marriage can survive renovations. Yes, here. <laughs>